G'day you mob, Pete here, and this is another episode of Aussie English, the number one place for anyone and everyone wanting to learn Australian English. So, today I have a GOSS episode for you where I sit down with my old man, my father, Ian Smithson, and we talk about the week's news, whether locally down under here in Australia or (laughs) non-locally overseas in other parts of the world, okay? And we sometimes also talk about whatever comes to mind, right? If we can think of something interesting to share with you guys related to us or Australia, we also talk about that in the GOSS. So, these episodes are specifically designed to try and give you content about many different topics where we're obviously speaking in English and there are multiple people having a natural and spontaneous conversation in English. So, it is particularly good to improve your listening skills. In order to complement that though, I really recommend that you join the podcast membership or the academy membership at aussieenglish.com.au where you will get access to the full transcripts of these episodes, the PDFs, the downloads, and you can also use the online PDF reader to read and listen at the same time, okay? So, if you really, really want to improve your listening skills fast, get the transcript, listen and read at the same time, keep practicing, and that is the quickest way to level up your English. Anyway, I've been rabbiting on a bit. I've been talking a bit. Let's just get into this episode, guys. Smack the bird and let's get into it. So, how's um, how's the week been, Dad? How are you going? Yeah, good. Hang on. I've got to control this beer. I don't know what- Oh, it's okay. Cranky Misses, it's actually okay. Cranky oh, Misses Double IPA from um, Salt Brewing Company in Aries Inlet, Victoria. Shout out to them. If you yeah. want to sponsor this show, please get yeah, in that's contact. It. I was confused for a long time when um, IPA seems to mean quite a few different things, like International Phonetic Alphabet. Yes. Uh, yeah. Indian Pale Ale. Yeah. But it's not called an Indian Pale Ale because it's from India, right? No, it's because it was for taking to India. Yeah. Um, Back in the days when in the early British colonisation of India, they wanted to ship beer out there because uh, it was easier than water, funnily enough, because it would keep better on ships. And um, the only way they could keep it without it going off, as in getting bacterial uh, infections, if you can get a bacterial <laughs> infection in a beer. You can. But, That's what we yeah, call it when we're yeah. doing the whiskey oh, stuff. Exactly, yeah. because it's it, the bacteria is actually affecting um, the- uh, the quality of the product in the end. Um, well, it competes but- with the yeast to get the yeah. alcohol or yeah. to get to yeah. um, get the sugar, but it also creates other congeners yeah. and esters that are gross. Exactly. And, and toxins in there. In there. Um, so, yeah. um, the reason they called it Indian Pale Ale is because in- and we look at it here, and this is actually quite a dark beer if- uh, you know, it's not If you could color, actually see, you through actually see through glass. the brown glass. Yeah. Um, is because it was paler than a traditional uh, British ale, okay. uh, which is quite flat. And not exactly sweet, but not bitter. Um, And so, they um, increased the hops in it uh, and the increasing the hops acted as a preservative. Yeah. So, the beer would last a lot longer, which meant the three or four months that it took to get around, uh, you know, to India 250 years ago, meant that the beer would survive. Yeah. So, that's where Indian pale ale comes from. But this one is a double IPA. I think double, <laughs> the I-I, the first I yeah. um, actually means nothing. Um, but what it means, it means is it's that stronger it's stronger than the usual yeah, IPA. And I right? think what they didn't want to put was D-I-P-A because <laughs> then it just sounded ridiculous. But Dipper. It means it's double strength. Um, so, it's typically double strength in hops and double strength in alcohol. Hang on. What have we got? 2.2 standard drinks in this, which means it's about 8% alcohol, which yeah. as opposed to your normal beer, which is four to four and a half in Australia. Oh, yeah. Far out. Unlike the rat's piss that they drink in America. They so. love their, their cheap beers, right? Yeah. Yeah. And they think- Well, some of them are great. I, don't get me wrong. Some of the best beers I've ever had have been in North America, but the standard you know, big brand beers over there are about two and a half, three percent 3% alcohol and they taste like rat's piss. Not that I've ever drunk rat's piss. <laughs> but- Budweiser. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Bud well, Light. And yeah. yeah, there's a bunch of Canadian <laughs> ones as well. But- all right, man. So, first, I'm not mentioning cause, but- first story that came up mm. was uh, Australian philanthropists spending big and fast to fight catastrophic yes. climate change. So, this yeah. was a cool article. And I guess sort of to give you the rundown there, I'll just give you the points that I've got here. Jeff and Julie Wicks, when they retired, decided that they had more than enough to live on and they wanted to give the rest away. I think they had no children either. Yeah, so, they were right. kind of like, well, yeah. there's no point. You can't- We can't I- take it with us. What did I hear the other day? Someone was like, you can't- 
um, there's no tow bar on a hearse. Yeah, exactly. So you can't put a trailer you of can't full take of stuff. All your stuff with you. Yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. Yeah. Although the pharaohs thought they could. Well, yeah, they, <laughs> including exactly. other people, <laughs> including other people. Yeah, they took all their slaves with them. Yeah. Anyway, so um, yeah, they set up a private philanthropic foundation, one of sixteen hundred that mm-hmm. are uh, around in Australia, and they're giving away ten times more than what they live on every single year for the next decade or so. And the interesting thing here is that they, as well as a few of the others that will go through, are setting it up not to last forever, but to spend down. Yes. So, that they spend more in the short term, but they're killing all of the, um, I guess, the ability for it to maintain its size and and the money that comes out of it. They are. Because they want to get as much done as possible for climate change in the next decade. And And during their lifetime, I think, so that they can actually see what's happening to it. Because if you create a philanthropic fund- yeah. That is going to pull five percent off a year or whatever, so that you actually maintain the balance. Uh, then you're, you know, you're not doing, you're not having a big hit in any one go. And typically, those sort of trusts are set up for things like scholarships and so on. So well, the Nobel you Prize be able to would be an example, yeah, right? Exactly. You know how much you're going to pull out every year to achieve yeah. what you want to achieve. Um, so all you need is a balance that's going to, you know, you know, typically in an average year. Although who knows what an average year is this year? We've uh, worldwide interest rates are so low <laughs> that you effectively can't just stick it in a bank and rely on the balance being maintained. So that actually makes sense in their case as well. Is to well spend it up now because you're not going to win any money on it well, you know, by investing. But it's it, also pressing, more, right? The, yeah, the issue exactly. is pressing, so. time sensitive. Mm. Um, we had Sue and John McKinnon who are running a, f- a similar foundation to. Um, plan- well, they- where they're planning to give away $10 million over 10 years. And they originally aimed to continue it into the future, but decided that, you know, they, they wanted their legacy to be mainly the climate change fight. Um, and they recently helped that um, the lawyer, David Barnden, who was representing, I believe, a 25-year-old Brisbane man who sued REST, um, the superannuation fund REST over its climate change disclosures. So, mm. I, I don't know the story too in- intricately, but I have a feeling that REST had obviously said it was doing more than it really was. Yeah, I think they were making- And this is just disclaimer here. Mm-hmm. I've read the story ages ago and I can't remember the detail, but- from memory, I think it was they were making claims of only investing in environmentally friendly corporations and funds. Yeah. And it turned out that some of those were owning coal and stuff like that. Well, and but, now they've and been- I'm Not the specific is, yeah, not necessarily the case, but- Well, now <laughs> they've been forced, I think, after this case to make sure that they commit to net zero emissions for all investments by 2050. Yeah. So, that happened. Um, then we had Norman Peter, who wants to spend- $40 million in the next 10 years. And this was the sort of coolest story that I liked out of it. He and I assume his his wife, I believe, um, have obviously a lot of money and they, they plan to revegetate biodiversity. So, mm. they've gone, I think most recently, they went to WA to the wheat belt and they bought up a bunch of these farms that were something like 2,000 hectares. Yeah, and these it are farms each that or people or are effectively walking away from and yeah. selling because they can't be productive on them at the moment. Because of so, the drought and everything. Because of the drought. And and look, the, uh, the farming industry across Australia over the last 10 years, because of the sort of mm. cycling of droughts around the country, has really struggled. And a lot of- Old family farms um, have had to have just been sold up because people can't afford them. So, I think this is one example where they've they've purchased land that was no longer going to be used for farming yeah. um, and are going to do something else with it rather than trying to maintain uh, a farming you know, thing. Not there's anything wrong with farmers, but- Well, it is getting more and more expensive. And you have that uh, interesting thing of like, say, down here on the Bellarine Peninsula, um, Suburb suburbia is kind of encroaching on farmland, and so the rates keep going up as yes. the councils decide we want to re yeah rezone well, rezone these areas so yeah. that if you wanted to well, keep the populations a- booming down here, you know, when we moved yeah. down, even Ocean Grove, the town that we live in, yeah, when we moved down here, I think the resident population was about eight thousand people. Yeah, about twelve thousand people owned houses because half the houses here were um, you know, holiday houses. Yeah. Um, but now the population's over 15,000. It's doubled in the time that we've yeah, been here. Yeah, not to mention during s- summertime. Well, summer it goes up to 50,000, you know, you know, peaking over yeah. that Christmas New Year period and then the uh, Australia Day holiday at the end of the school holidays. So. so, this guy, Norman Peter, is planning to- I think he wants to buy up a million hectares. He's just bought up 2,000 hectares and it is part of his carbon farming foundation. So, mm. the plan is to revegetate it. So, plant as many trees- as will fill up the land, and I assume native trees. And then he is trying to make it profitable 
for people to effectively farm nature where they just have the land and then I don't know how the money works, but I would imagine that either companies need to buy yeah, offsets offsetting. or yeah. the government may have grants or pay for certain amounts of, um, mm. you know, uh, CO2 tonnage to be yeah. pulled out of the yeah. atmosphere every year. And so, I think he was saying that the farmers currently get $16 a tonne of CO2 um, that they pull out per year, which is apparently $10 a tonne short before it becomes feasible. Yeah. And so, we would have to put some things into place. But- yeah, I just thought it was really cool that there are a lot of these obviously well off to very wealthy yes. people that yeah. are will- willing to give away large amounts of their fortune to the point of all of their fortune um, that isn't going to impinge upon their ability to live and, and retire. Yeah, well, and we talked about, um, uh, apologies, I can't remember his name, one of the wealthiest miners in Australia uh, who at the end of the bushfire season uh, last summer just donated $75 million to um, investigating, you know, bushfire uh, hazard and what we can do about it. To, uh, I know the guy you're talking about. It. Yeah. Let's yeah. see if I can- Sorry, it was just- But that's another example of somebody who just says, yeah, I've got more than enough money to live on. I'm never going to need to mm-hmm. you know, be <laughs> cheap with my money. It'll be Andrew Forrest, so, right? It was Andrew Forrest, Andrew yeah. Forrest. Well, ironic name. Um, I love it. Uh, I just type yeah. in Australia minor billionaire and yeah. it's just Andrew Bang. Forrest. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so a- Andrew Forrest, yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, a few tens of millions is is not going to put a dent in his uh, his uh, bank balance. But at the same time, he's doing something where he just said, "We need to do something straight away." So let's yeah. throw tens of millions of dollars at research into uh, bushfires and what we can do to mitigate against them, um, because it's all very well to you know recover from them, but what can we do to, that'll reduce the chance of bushfires? A lot of which is climate change. Well, and, they're interrelated, and they're obviously interrelated. Yeah. But there are you know f- uh, forest management, um, and even just the way bushfires are fought. Um, yeah, can we do more preventative work up front? Can we fight bushfires in a particular way that is not going to mean that we're really just trying to hold them from getting you know from going crazy? So. Yeah, there's a lot of good stuff being done. One of the other things that I heard of recently, and I don't know any specific names, but there seems to be a movement now of people who, particularly those who are going to leave property in in their estate um, with no inheritance, you know, so they're not, you know, they don't have children or anybody to inherit. And they're not giving it away. They're not to giving someone, it away to someone else's name. Yeah, they're um, they're leaving their land um, to the government with a covenant on it that it has to remain. Um, as natural bushland, yeah, uh, okay. or to be revegetated, they're leaving yeah. money to revegetate as natural bush, natural bushland, and incorporating those into state parks, national parks, and so on. So that it's effectively saying, you know, what we are doing is giving our way land away to the government, and they can never do anything else with it. Yeah. In order to accept those sort of things, you have to accept the covenant on them. So um, that's another interesting way that people are starting to um, effectively leave a legacy to the environment. When they go. Well, I was- Yeah, I've just typed in here, Norway, um, billion dollar donation to Brazil for protecting its rainforest. Yeah. Which was a cool sort of similar thing where obviously Norway is looking around and kind of like, well, we can't really do much here in our own country, but we can invest this money into other countries to mm. try and encourage them to- you know, maintain the forest that they do have. Although yeah, exactly. at the moment in Brazil, they're probably having a bit of trouble with Bolsonaro and the deforestation that's occurring there. Yes, but if the if the Norwegian government, for instance, are effectively buying that up as private land, yeah, then that doesn't give the the government of Brazil the right to do what they want with it. Well, the government won't. They will take it anyway. But you know. the government won't. <laughs> but they'll have they have a lot of issues with just illegal logging. Yeah, exactly. Where they just go in and strip the place yeah. and then come out and they don't own the land. Yeah. Um, but the the sort of question and the thing I want to end this episode um, chatting about was responsibility mm. with with answering climate change because we've obviously got many different levels here where you've got the individual whether rich or poor you've got corporations you've got the government and then just society as a whole where do you think the buck stops at any individual one of those or at all of well, them? Well I, I think there are elements of all of them if if we're going to be serious about stopping climate change. It's all very well for me as a sort of left-wing greenie for the last, you know, well, 60-plus years, although, you know, probably 50-plus years. 60-plus, yeah, my you political were three, and you're I like, three I'm and a I was waving greenie. the greenie flag, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tying, myself, stop climate tying myself change. to trees, which it's I probably was doing at three, but not for, the, not for that reason. Um, 
I think, yeah, as individuals, we can do our own little bit. Yeah. But um, if we're going to be making those statements of saying the government should, the government should, corporations should, and so on, then then we've got to start doing things as well. And and some of that is um, is investing in and or purchasing uh, environmental or climate friendly products. Yeah. Um, buying our electricity from companies that are investing in in uh, it, I keep using the term, and I think we'd mentioned last time that, that people keep saying renewable energy, but yeah, wind power and solar power is not renewable. The wind doesn't come back, and the solar energy doesn't come back. It's effectively endless. It's supply more like it's more like free, free. energy, yeah, right? It's like free. It's, it's free energy yeah. except for the technology to extract it. But uh, so I think those sort of things, uh, because yeah, realistically, yes, I could say, well, yeah, and now it's a bit of a yeah, I could put my hat on and say. I'm not going to fly overseas for the next two years because I don't want to do that. But I'm not going to fly overseas for the next two years anyway because of the uh, COVID experience. We've but all been forced. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, and funnily enough, there's um, we've got plenty of examples around the world at the moment where just general air pollution has reduced significantly. Well, they saw that in, in China during in China. the lockdown and India, um, I think, yeah, during exactly. their lockdown too. Where they're locking people down so there aren't as many cars and trucks on the road yeah. and therefore there's less air pollution. So, and you Maybe know, we just visual need to air pollution every is, year. You yeah. know, we'll have one year on, one year mm-hmm. off. Yeah. And look, <laughs> Sorry, I think economy. Some, yeah, well, but, but some of those things are, uh, and I know that uh, I think it was the RACV and the NRMA, two of our big- automotive um, clubs, effectively. So, you you, know, you belong to the um, the RACV in Victoria, the what Royal Automobile for? Club of Victoria, uh, which typically used to be that you're effectively buying insurance for breakdowns. Yeah. So, if you broke down, they would come out and get your car running again and tow it to the nearest service station so you get it fixed, that sort of thing. But they've become much bigger. They're the biggest clubs in Australia, you know, the two of them, the New South Wales one. Um, the NRMA, and I can't remember the exact acronym, but well, it's not an acronym because it's not a word. It won't be but, RACV yeah. or whatever it is over there. It'll be RAC NWS. NSW. NSW. But between the two of them, they, you know, they've got millions of members. Yeah. So, and you pay, you know, anything from a hundred to a couple of hundred dollars a year, depending on the level of cover you want. Uh, but they do a lot of work into you know, research into traffic modeling and, you know, best cars to buy and you know, these sort of conditions and so on. But there was a study done by both of them a few years ago uh, looking at the difference in traffic flow over school holidays when mm. there is only about a 10% reduction in the number of people who are driving to and from work and taking kids to and from school and so on. But Melbourne and Sydney are you know, the two biggest and most congested cities in Australia. Uh, Sydney it, more than Melbourne, right? Uh, yeah, well, it's arguable. Sydney, I think, has got a um, just an artificial- <laughs> congestion because the the center of sydney is struggles with the harbor yeah. so that you don't have as much entry and exit to the city and also the streets are narrow and windy and so on but yeah anyway it doesn't matter particularly matter which one's yeah the the worst to drive in um, I'd say Melbourne was the worst to drive in because Melbourne drivers are assholes. Sydney drivers <laughs> seem to be nice because they're driving in narrower streets. But or because we've uh, got hook turns, right? Yeah, we've got you, all sorts of bizarre. You need to pull onto the wrong side yeah, of the road. Wait you pull for the on the left side of the road to turn right, and then turn. And, yeah. yeah, all that sort of stuff. But um, that aside, ten percent reduction um, was about a thirty percent reduction in time to travel. And so that sort of thing means, and a 10% reduction, all that means is that regardless of school holidays, if every person had the opportunity of working from home once a fortnight, once every two weeks, then we would have that 10% reduction. So it's not just faster travel time, but it means less pollution and so yeah. on. So those sort of things are going to happen. And, and I think we've got to the point now with our... Um, experience in COVID that a lot of people can work from home that previously didn't think they could. Definitely. So, that's at that individual level, back to your- When well, you wonder thing, how much corporations are going to take, take from that And that's the too. next thing, is, is that corporations can say, apart from just having the family-friendly thing of being able to work from home, to say, we're going to allow our people to work but from home- It can be a gift and be, a curse. Oh, yeah. It can be yeah. a gift and a curse <laughs> in terms but, of productivity and distraction. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but then, if you- Like, I was working in Melbourne, living down yeah. here- and that was four or five hours of travel a day. Yeah. Even if we had the 10% reduction, which meant it was faster, mm-hmm. um, it'll be three and a half or four hours a day. You just get to listen um, to podcasts like Aussie English. Aussie English, <laughs> yeah. And, and I read a lot of books, I claim, <laughs> yeah, but I actually had a lot of other people reading books We need to another me, but, verb, yeah. I think, for that, for audiobooks, because mm. it sounds weird to say listen to an audiobook. I listen to a book. 
Yeah. But also people will say, have you read this? And I'm like, I go, well, no, I had someone to else read to me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which, which actually, in some cases, depending on the, the actor, performer, narrator, can yeah. enhance the experience. Oh, 100%. But, yeah. But anyway, so I think there's that corporate thing. But then obviously corporations have that, you know, we are going to do things in an environmentally friendly way. Yeah. Uh, but then coming back to government, I think the government is ultimately the biggest hammer that we have. Yeah. And we need governments to actually come in and say, we are going to have a long term view of this. We're going to commit to things in 2030, 2040, 2050 and beyond rather than saying, oh, we can't afford to do this right now because right now is always the problem for government. Uh, particularly in Australia, where we only have three-year terms for federal government, which means they get, you know, one year of electioneering, they get elected, they get one year of breaking the promises that they did, they get the <laughs> middle year of actually trying to do something, yeah. um, and then they're back into election mode. So, um, if we have governments that are going to say, we're going to commit to something over a 20, 30, 50-year time and make sure that they set up practices and procedures and policies to enable that to happen, then that's how we're going to solve the problem. We're never going to solve the problem by government saying we're going to do this now. Um, what we have to have them say is we're going to do this little bit now, but commit to it over a long period of time. Do you think rich people or people who are well off and have more money than they, they need in order to live mm. a, a good quality life after retirement, and I mean, I guess that's kind of subjective, do you think that they bear more responsibility than the average um, person- you know, making an average income or less? Or do we yeah. all have an equal responsibility irrespective of how well, much I think money we all, you have? We all have an equal responsibility, but we don't all have the equal capability of doing something about it, yeah. uh, certainly financially. Um, you know, we can all change our behaviour, but if Bill Gates changes his behaviour, it probably doesn't affect anybody more than me changing my behaviour. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, but this this became. I mean, sorry to interrupt you. No. To get to your the sort of point where I feel like you're going. I think they. I remember learning e ethics at university, and I think it was Peter Singer who brought up the whole. There's a sort of, I guess, the libertarian argument of imagine you're walking past a dam or a body of water, and there's a boy drowning. Is it unethical to just keep walking if you know you could save that boy? Mm. But because it's not you, you if you kept walking, do you bear any responsibility? And I guess the parallel I'm trying to draw here is that if you are someone who is incredibly rich and have much more than you need, and it's effectively no skin off your nose. Yes. To, if you have the capability to, to try and make a difference then, or to help someone I think or to we save all do. lives. And yeah, climate is just one thing. There's, yes. Yeah, and I use Bill Gates as an example. And the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has invested- Billions, like you know, tens to hundreds of billions of dollars over the last twenty years, um, mostly into uh, disease control, you know, yeah, major disease control. Like well, AIDS and I'm and sure, malaria. I'm sure uh, what he would have done is, I'm getting filthy rich, and I have more money than I'm ever going to spend in my entire lifetime, mm. especially on affluent stuff. Which I doubt. I don't know Bill Gates very well, but by the sounds of it, by the way, well, he's I don't actually portrayed, know him at all. But <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, exactly. By the way he's that he's public. portrayed, he doesn't seem portrayed. like the kind of guy who's like, I want a Ferrari, I want a really big mansion. He's not. Even the kind if he of, does, yeah, buying a Ferrari in a really big mansion is nothing in comparison with the billions of dollars exactly. that just keep pouring into his personal bank account. But so. I imagine they get to a point where you're kind of like the guilt, the 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 elephant in the room. That's going to be behind me or on my shoulders permanently mm. if I don't start doing something because I have the the ability to, right? Like walking past that that dam and seeing a boy drowning, yeah. screaming help, and you're like, I'm a professional swimmer. Yeah, I'm but a I can't be bothered. But I, yeah, yeah I, I, I'm late for a date. You know, exactly. So. I would literally just have to go pop and then pull him out, you yeah. know, and it would be no skin off my nose and I just jog up and keep going. So, I think there is that, and I like the example because I think there is that moral responsibility that, let's face, most of us actually have. Um, well, and to, sorry, I remember to try my and do point. what we are capable of doing. I imagine yes. that he just looked at the plethora of things that are affecting humanity and just said, which is the one that I can have the greatest effect on um, alleviating suffering or, yeah. or reducing the number of people dying? And so, it was like malaria, AIDS, mm. malnutrition, mm. Yeah. bam, that's my- that's the hill I'll die on. Yeah, exactly. And, look, and a, this is a fictional example, but there's an episode in- the West Wing, uh, one of my favourite American TV shows. Um, He's probably mentioned where it on I probably have. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'll mention it again. Um, where one of the characters is looking at- um, This is coming towards the end of the, you know, the presidency. And one of the characters in there is looking at, well, what do I do now? I'm no longer going to be working in the White House. And she's looking for alternative jobs. And you know, this fictional, extremely wealthy person 
just wants to interview her. Um, and his pitch is, what if you had endless resources, what would you like to do? And she came up with a couple of things. And he said, all right, what if I gave you a billion dollars? What do you think you could do? Mm. And she went, oh. <laughs> yeah, and that and that's the sort of thing. Yeah, for him, yeah, they get a fictional example, but for and as your example with uh, Bill and Melinda Gates, if you've got billions of dollars, throwing a few billion dollars at something makes a huge difference in comparison with me donating a few hundred dollars to the local life saving club yes. or to the Red Cross or to you know, one of those things. It so. must be a weird position to be in, where you must almost feel like a bit of a wizard, right? Mm. Where you have the ability to just make. Uh, you know, the problem of thousands, potentially millions, millions of, of people, people just go away. Yeah. Of well, like- Two biggest killers in boom. Africa. Yeah. We, well, he, he, I'm sure, just looked at this and said, we're not going to solve this, but yeah. we can certainly alleviate it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, and that's- I, I get irritated with people shitting on people like Bill Gates because you're kind of like, look, you just hate him because he's rich. You hate him mm. because you don't like capitalism, although you have an iPhone and all these other things. Exactly. Whereas, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, he's doing as much as I imagine he can do or, or you know, he's in a position to do to try and save people's lives. Yeah. Because he's in a position to do it, you know. And so, what else do you want from him? What else should he do? Should he just give the money to you? Yeah. Like, well, who's more important? People in, you know, countries that are suffering from yeah. this and, sort of disease that and there you is, don't there suffer is that, from? There is that element, too, of saying, uh, Bill Gates is only earning that sort of money because he is a major shareholder in one of the world's biggest companies that yeah. he started. Uh, it's the same thing with Apple or Google. or Now, Apple's a bit different because the two founders of Apple are no longer there. But- yeah. Um, but yeah, those sort of people, and Steve Jobs while he was alive, uh, in the case of Apple, but any of those people who have got you know, huge corporations that they have started themselves, it's not like they can suddenly go, oh, well, I'm just going to give all the money away. Yeah. Because the only reason they're getting that money is that they are shareholders in those companies and they are earning money from those companies. Oh, that's the and thing. there are millions of other shareholders around the world who are relying on those investments for their yeah, retirement income and, um, and you know, propping up their own incomes and so on. So, they're not just going to go, you know, Bill Gates could just say, well, I'll sell Microsoft tomorrow, mm -hmm. but Microsoft's still going to keep going. Somebody else is going to buy it. Mm. <laughs> Assuming <laughs> someone so, can afford to. Yeah, well, uh, exactly. So, Amazon yeah, will. Yeah, yeah, well, that's Amazon or, <laughs> or Apple. Apple. Yeah, or Google or Facebook. Uh, far yeah. out. Good episode, Dave. Yeah, cheers. Cheers. Um, salt, I'll be coming down the road looking for sponsorship. <laughs> Alrighty, you mob, thank you so much for listening to or watching this episode of The Goss. If you would like to watch the video, if you're currently listening to it and not watching it, you can do so on the Aussie English TV channel on YouTube. This is different from the main channel. You'll be able to subscribe to that. Just search Aussie English TV on YouTube. And if you're watching this and not listening to it, you can check this episode out also on the Aussie English podcast, which you can find via my free Aussie English podcast application on both Android and iPhone. You can download that for free or you can find it via any other good podcast uh, app that you've got on your phone, Spotify, podcast from iTunes, Stitcher, whatever it is. I'm your host, Pete. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you have a ripper of a day and I will see you next time. Peace.